Okay, so um, I'm going to be talking all about speech and language uh, problems today. So here are some sort of example problems. Uh, speech recognition, here the problem is to take a, an acoustic recording, maybe a, a sentence or two or a longer period of speech and to transcribe this to turn it into a sequence of words. Uh, second is machine translation, uh, taking uh, a paragraph or a document in one language, um, producing a translation in a second language. And finally, I'm going to talk about this a lot towards the end of the talk, this problem of question answering, which um, there are many definitions, but roughly speaking, we have some question, um, we have either the entire web or maybe a particular web page, uh, and we try to, in some sense, produce an answer to that question. So these are all highly complex tasks that are performed both by humans and also by machines. Um, as background here, you know, just to think about the field, in some sense, there's a story of two revolutions. So the first revolution um, was the move to statistical and machine learning approaches, um, going back to actually to the 1970s for speech recognition and the late, late 1980s, uh, roughly speaking, for NLP. Okay, and this was an absolutely seismic shift. Um, certainly, in NLP, people have been trying to handcraft rule-based systems for many, many years. Um, there are various reasons that, that people found that to be very hard. It's very hard to build rule-based systems for a problem this complex. Uh, and so there was absolutely pivotal work, um, largely coming out of the work in speech recognition, which then uh, came into language. That was roughly when I started my PhD, sort of mid-90s, uh, mid I guess I was just at the start of that revolution. Second revolution is the neural revolution. And so um, you're all very, very familiar with this. Let me give you some concrete results and a couple of tasks. <laughs> Um, the first is speech recognition. This is performance on a benchmark task called switchboard. This is pretty ta challenging conversational speech. Uh, rapid progress as usual when the data set was first released. Things really plateauing and you know, there's a lot of hard work going into sort of refinement, iteration on previously developed methods and then absolutely dramatic pro progress in the last few years using neural methods. And I'll, I'll describe some work on that in the first part of this talk. Here's a second task, which is very uh, close to my own work. This is natural language parsing. I'll talk uh, actually in the second part of my, my talk uh, briefly about this. Um, this is accuracy in recovering syntactic structures on a, a famous corpus called the Penn Tree Bank. Um, again, some you know substantial early progress. Things in the 2000s were kind of uh, certainly giving improvements, but things have pretty much plateaued by the mid 2000s. I think it's fair to say. Um, this graph is a little bit uh, deceptive. This is 2016, this is 2006. So a lot of time went by here and then neural methods kicked in and they've more or less halved the error rate on this task. Absolutely dramatic results, which I, I, I found ex find, still find extremely surprising. Um, so in this talk, I'm really gonna be going over um, three problems and three architectures. So the first is speech recognition. I'm gonna talk about simple feed forward networks and some re results on that. Second is natural language parsing and the use of um, word embeddings critically in the combination with feed forward networks. And finally, I'm gonna talk about question answering and transformers and BERT, although I think Chris um, Manning spoke uh, a bunch about that yesterday, but so I'll re revisit that briefly. And for, for each of these cases, this is gonna be a fairly high level talk, but what I wanna do is sort of talk about empirical successes on these problems, but also argue that we really don't have a full understanding of what's going on. And I want to throw out what I see as some very, very important sort of fundamental problems uh, about understanding these, these classes of models. Okay, okay so um, first part of the talk is speech recognition. So this is work by uh, Avner May, who was a PhD student of mine at Columbia, uh, and also Fei Shah's group um, at uh, USC, and uh, Brian Kingsbury at IBM, and Daniel Sue at Columbia, so uh, a bunch of collaborators. Um, we were looking at uh, speech recognition using actually um, a simple architecture, and it's an early, an early neural architecture, but it basically led to the first kind of breakthrough uh, in, in around 2013 in the second revolution of neural methods. And um, here's the basic architecture. So you have some speech waveform. You split it into relatively short windows, say 10 milliseconds in length. For each 10 millisecond uh, window, you extract a feature vector, typically representing the energy at different frequencies within that 10 millisecond frame. And then you try to make a prediction, which is uh, which phoneme actually, or which sound in English, say, underlies that particular frame. Okay, so the acoustic model um, takes a frame and 
outputs, uh, at least in this case, a posterior distribution, a probability distribution over the possible um, phoneme labels. Okay. So, uh, in a nutshell, given a vector x representing a 10 millisecond portion of speech, predict the phone label y, or more generally, a distribution py given x. Um, these conditional distributions at the per frame level can then be combined to form an overall hypothesis for the entire sentence. I'm going to gloss over that, but just assume there's some way of integrating this information from different frames. And um, the first architecture we're going to look at is a vanilla feed forward network. So, um, on the order of, say, four or five layers, roughly 1,000 neurons per layer. Uh, on a broadcast news task, which is uh, red, sort of television news, 50 hours of training data, which is a moderate, not small, not large amount of training data, the word error rate's around 16%. This is a, um, a, 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 was a very competitive result when, when we first saw these things. Um, so this is a very simple architecture, but it's the first architecture where, where I'll argue that it's really not terribly well understood why it works well. Um, here are some results from Avner May and others using Rahimi and Rex ideas. So let me just briefly describe this. Uh, I think um, many of you will have seen this idea. So Rahimi and Rex basically describe a, a construction um, where you have a single layer neural network. Um, you essentially have random weights in the first layer and you have a particular choice of activation function, a, a cosine activation function. And um, this essentially leads to, in the simplest case, to a convex optimization problem where you're just optimizing the, the top level weights in, in this network. The justification for this is as the number of neurons increases, you basically um, can show using some pretty straightforward Fourier analysis that the approach uh, approaches performance of an SVM-like approach with a particular kernel, with an RBF kernel. Um, so what we basically showed in this work is that with enough features, so with a wide enough network under this kind of construction, and I'm talking about a, a quite large number of features in the orders of maybe hundreds of thousands. It took a lot of work to scale to this kind of size. Um, these models basically match uh, the performance of a vanilla feedforward network. Okay? So that leads to, to, to what I think is you know, a first fundamental question. You, know, you have these two models on this task, and it's uh, a large-scale task. It's probably... I think fair to say it, it certainly was the largest scale task on which Rahimi and Rect features had been applied. You have these two architectures. Here we have a deep network with backpropagation right the way through it. Here we have a shallow network with random initialization. And these models give very similar levels of accuracy. And that seems highly suggestive. Um, on the other hand, the deep network is much more efficient. Okay? So you need many fewer neurons. Uh, backpropagation is relatively efficient. And there are, there are questions there. Um, so I think there's sort of a very interesting set of theoretical questions relating these two. Um, and it may well be that we're on track to do this. For example, the work by Sanjeev and others recently on infinite limits of infinite uh, width networks may well be pointing in, in equivalence between uh, these deep networks, these vanilla feedforward networks, um, and uh, kernel methods. Okay. So that's the first result. The second result I want to talk about is um, the use of word embeddings. This is a second architecture, okay? So um, now we're going to move to language from speech. And our uh, first critical idea is to represent words through so-called embedding vectors, okay? So um, basically think of each word having its own vector. A typical dimension might be uh, something in the range roughly 100 to 1,000, okay? Um, and these embeddings are learned. They can be learned in a variety of ways. I'm going to talk about one particular way, which is probably, I think, underemphasized, but I think is extremely important. Um, the intuition here is that you somehow learn to embed words in a fairly low dimensional space where somehow commonalities between different words are represented in that low dimensional space. More on that later. Building on top of that, there's this architecture, the seminal architecture from Colibet et al. from about 2011 which is the following. Okay? So in many cases, we want to make some prediction in natural language where we have a, a sequence of words. So think of an entire sentence or maybe a subsequence of words within that sentence. So the, in the simplest case, imagine you wanted to take this word soar and predict it's part of speech. This is a very simple problem. You know, is it a verb versus a noun? You might look at the word itself and you might want to also look at its surrounding context. So here we have a sequence of four words and we somehow want to represent these within a neural network. Um, so the Colibert et al. architecture works as follows. You firstly do an embedding lookup for each word. Each word gets an embedding. Okay? 
Um, then we concatenate these embeddings, so we preserve ordering of those words. Okay, and then we push this through a feedforward network and we make a label uh, or a prediction. Okay, and um, um, it's important to realize that we backpropagate typically right the way through this network. So there are ways of training these embeddings on large quantities of unlabeled data. So, for example, using word to vec or potentially BERT and so on. But the result I'm actually going to focus on is, is purely backpropagation right the way through. So you take the label and you backpropagate and you learn these embeddings as part of the entire learning problem. Okay. This architecture, as it turns out, was, I think, the first, you know, first, well, we'll talk about a result in a moment, which really first convinced me that something was going on with neural methods for language. It was this architecture which, which had that breakthrough result. So I'm going to talk about in this part of the talk uh, natural language parsing. And that's the problem of taking a sentence, such as the following, and trying to predict some representation of its grammatical structure. And one representation along these lines is um, what are called dependency parses. Here we have labeled arcs between words showing grammatical relationship. For, so for example, bell, in some sense, is the subject of makes. There's a directed arc here from makes to bell. Uh, products is, in some sense, the direct object of makes. Uh, there's a directed arc between these two things. OK, this, these representations go back to uh, at least Chomsky's work from the 1950s, they're seen as fundamental in language. They're often seen as the first step in trying to build an interpretation of language. Uh, you know, so uh, when we get to question answering, we'll, we'll, we'll revisit that to some extent. Okay, so the problem here is to take a sentence and predict its syntactic structure. And we're going to assume that we have many labeled examples consisting of sentences with human labeled syntactic structures. Okay. Um, and the particular architecture I'm going to talk about is uh, shift-reduced neural parsing. And this goes back to uh, work by Dan Chi Chen and Chris Manning from 2014. And to me, this was really the first result in neural models for language where it was clear to me that something really very interesting and very substantial was going on. The, the empirical results in this paper were remarkable. So the basic idea is the following. We represent a parse tree as a sequence of shift-reduced actions. So we represent a parse as some sequence of actions in building a tree. And we essentially use a neural network to predict uh, each action depending on the particular context. The challenge here is that human languages, unlike programming languages, tend to be pathologically ambiguous. And so they're an extremely large space. You can basically think of the space of all um, possible directed trees in some sense being uh, possible under a grammar or some, some very large subset of the space of all possible uh, directed trees. Okay. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about the shift reduce system, but basically you have some configuration, considering cons of a stack, a buffer, and some set of dependencies, some kind of working space. And at every point, you can perform various actions, like shift, or you can create a dependency arc, or you can create another dependency arc going in the opposite direction. So you basically have a problem where uh, you have some state, some parsing state. And uh, at each point, you want to predict some action. We have supervised data, uh, which is used to predict, predict those actions. And um, the neural approach builds very directly on top of Colbert et al.'s work. So we have a set of feature extractors that extract various words from the parse state. So maybe you know, the top two words on the stack or the top two words on the buffer. These items are embedded. They're concatenated. And then they're pushed through a feedforward network very similar to the feedforward networks we, we saw for speech. Um, so really, this is kind of similar to the speech architecture, but with this additional embedding step. And again, in learning, we can backpropagate right the way through this network. So we have supervision in the form of parse states paired with labels, and we can backpropagate uh, right the way through these things. Okay. Um, to give you a little bit more intuition, typically you might have on the order of 20 to 50 different features here. So you have a pretty high dimensional space. You might have on the order of 20 or 50 um, words and parts of speech and various other pieces of information about the parse state. Each of those might have, a, say, a 100 dimensional vector representing them. So you might end up after concatenation with a vector with a few thousand dimensions. And the feedforward network, actually empirically, I think you can get away with quite a small network, maybe one or two, two layers, a hundred, couple of hundred, a few hundred uh, neurons per layer. Okay. And here are some results. So um, these are results from a paper by myself and other collaborators at Google, but very much building on the work by Chen and Manning. 
Uh, this is a linear model with essentially um, similar kind of architecture, but with features that treat words as atoms. They certainly don't have embeddings, and they certainly don't use neural approaches. They essentially have a, a, a convex learning problem with hand-constructed features. And um, you know, this is the result of a couple of decades of research in some sense. This was the state of the art at the time, around 2011. And immediately, we see a neural network approach of the form of uh, this kind of Chen and Manning, or this Andrew Hotel paper I'm describing here, beating this. And the remarkable thing is that this is with actually greedy inference. So what that means is, at every step in decoding a sentence, we're simply going to take the most likely uh, pause action given the underlying pause state. So um, there's no search involved here, which was you know, typically any, any parser in, in the past with reasonable performance had used some kind of search. Okay. So that's remarkable. And if you use beam search and you, you train things in a way that works well with uh, beam, beam search, you can get up to about uh, 94 and a half. So this is a very substantial gain. And the most recent results on this problem are probably close to, closer to 97%. So absolutely dramatic improvements in dependency parsing. That's a longer story related to actually BERTs and transformers, which I'll talk about soon, which I think Chris spoke about yesterday. Um, so the main punchline here is that if you think about this architecture, uh, it's a remarkably simple architecture. It's just an embedding followed by concatenation and a feed-forward network. But it seems much more powerful than uh, previous approaches where we would use sort of handcrafted combinations of features, which would combine different words in the input. Uh, but there are many open questions. You know, what class of functions can these networks represent? Uh, what class of functions can uh, these networks learn. What do individual word embeddings uh, encode? Uh, so people often look at simple similarity and have this view that we're simply encoding the similarity between different words. I think that's actually probably a, a very impoverished way of looking at things. I think it's more likely if you think about the sort of compressed sensing or dictionary learning kind of view of things. It's more likely that these vectors are encoding various properties of each word, which can then be questioned by the neurons of the next layer. But I think we have very limited understanding of this. OK. How am I doing for time? OK. Um, so let me go into the third part of the talk. Um, and this is going to be on question answering and a particular architecture uh, transformers. Let me first talk about a data set which um, we re released earlier this year through Google. This is called the natural questions. Um, so the basic scenario is the following. We take a question from actually the, the Google query stream. Um, Typically, uh, on the more complex side, eight words or more, it looks like a question. Here's one example. When was the Egg McMuffin added to the menu? Um, we present an annotator with the top-ranked Wikipedia page for that question. And then their annotation procedure proceeds in two steps. Okay. So in the first step, they have to decide whether or not the page actually contains an answer to the question. So they can simply mark the fact that there's no answer on the page, or if there is an answer somewhere on the page, in this first step, they're going to mark a paragraph uh, where the paragraph has to contain the answer, and it also has to contain all the information that implies the answer. Okay? So this would be uh, the paragraph selected in this case. And in the second step, where possible, um, they mark a short answer from within this paragraph. Okay? Um, so in some cases, they don't go through this step. And for some questions, it's not appropriate to select a short answer. But for about 75% of the cases where we have a long answer, there's also a short answer, typically a date or a named entity or, or, or something along those lines. Okay. Um, so here are uh, some statistics from this, this data collection. So the questions are, as I said, they're real aggregated user queries from the Google search engine, about around 300,000 training samples. Um, we have five-way annotated data for development and test data. About 50% of the time, there's an answer on the page. 50% of the time, there's no answer on the page. So actually determining whether or not uh, there's an answer on the page will be a significant part of the problem. And about 35% of the time, the uh, examples have both a long and short answer. And about 1% of the time, we actually have a special case, uh, which are yes-no questions, which has resu resulted in a, a spin-off corpus called the Boolean questions, looking at just yes-no questions, which are particularly interesting. Here are some example questions, and they're a pretty broad set. You know, when are hops added to the brewing process? What does the word China mean in Chinese? When will the White House Christmas tree be lit? 
who lives in the Imperial Palace in Tokyo, that there's a, there's a pretty broad category of questions here. Why are we interested in this task? So let me give a little bit of motivation for this data collection effort. So we, we wanted to collect data like this so we could, you know, A, um, build models that try to replicate this human process of selecting answers, but also, I think, to understand much better how question answering and how natural language works in general. So the first motivation is that QA is certainly a useful end task, and I think that is uh, clear, at least to me. It's, it's, it's very natural for users to post real information needs in the form of questions, and it's incredibly important uh, as an end task. But it's also, I think, I would argue, a complex task that is a great way to get a real window into models of semantics and pragmatics, of real language use, of the meaning of words, of common sense reasoning, um, reference, and so on. Some important properties of the corpus, this particular corpus of natural questions. The queries are real user queries. So for example, the squad data set, which has been highly influential um, and has driven research the last few years, and rightfully has gotten a huge amount of attention, basically had humans first read paragraphs and write questions about those paragraphs prompted by those paragraphs, which was great as a start, but leads to highly prompted questions. Okay, so these are natural questions which are critically written by users who don't know the answers to those questions. The annotation task is close to a useful end task, and we were very careful about quality control. It's not easy to crowdsource these kind of annotations and get high quality annotations back. Okay, so let me briefly talk about um, a particular class of models for question answering, which sort of give the state of the art. And then I wanna finish up talking about challenges going forward um, with question answering and uh, these models and, uh, and other models. Okay, so transformers essentially build on this idea of word embeddings. So um, assume we have some input sequence, okay, some sequence of words W1 through WN. So think of it uh, for now as being a single sentence, for example. Um, through the word embedding trick, we can map this to a sequence of vectors X1 through Xn, where each Xi is a d-dimensional vector. For example, a typical dimension might be about 500. Uh, and again, this requires a lookup for each word uh, for its 512 dimensional representation. And these embeddings are typically learned through, through, through back propagation. Um, and the critical question to ans as answered by transformers is, you know, how do we actually map this to a new sequence, Z1 through Zn, uh, where, to keep things simple, let's assume these Zi's have the same dimensionality, but the Zi's now take the context into account. So now we essentially end up with an embedding for each word, but it's in some sense contextually dependent. Okay. And so the process is relatively simple. Just a little bit of notation. Uh, I'm gonna use the softmax operation on a matrix. So given a matrix A, if B is softmax A, then we just basically say that uh, we exponentiate the entries of A and we normalize uh, row-wise, okay? So z is just a, a partition function or a normalization term, which ensures that the rows sum to one. So this is just a way of taking a matrix of reals into a matrix who, whose rows define distributions in some sense. And so um, here's a very, very sort of compact way of writing a transformer. So assume we have a sequence of vectors x1 through xn. Um, define q to be the n by d matrix representing that entire sequence. So we have n words, d dimensions, we have an n by d matrix. And then we have some parameterized matrices, these are gonna be learned. A is d by L, B is d by L, L is some low dimensional space. Uh, C is d by O, think of O now, for now being the output dimension. It could, for now it's gonna be less than d, we'll see soon how we can make it equal to d. Um, we can then define z, the new matrix of output embeddings through softmax applied to this matrix divided by qc. So what's going on? qc is an, uh, an n by o matrix of new embeddings. So we basically projected each word embedding down to a lower dimensional space. q a b transpose q transpose is an n by n matrix basically measuring uh, the sort of attention between different words. So this is an n by n matrix saying how much attention each word should pay to the other words in the sentence. And softmax is an n by n matrix where each uh, entry is positive and the elements in the, each row sum to one. 
So let's actually see this visually. That will probably make things clearer. Um, say we're trying to calculate the new embedding for the word sore. Okay, we're going to actually calculate a new embedding for every word in the input sentence. But let's focus on word three. How do we do that? Well, we first look up the initial embeddings using the embedding dictionary, the usual thing. We project down to a lower dimensional space by multiplying by C. And then this quantity here is the third row of softmax applied to this matrix. And this basically defines a distribution saying how much this word, SOAR, should pay attention to each of the other words in the sentence. And the final embedding is just a convex combination of the other embeddings under that attention. Okay. So a, a couple of things, a couple of um, additions to this. Um, there's this, a variation called multi-head transformers, which is very important. Uh, let's say D is 512, O is 64. You can actually perform this operation eight times. So for J equals 1 to 8, you calculate uh, an embedding under this kind of process where we have these projections, these matrices A and B basically defining the attention weights between the inputs. And we have this lower dimensional uh, representation. And then we simply concat this, concatenate this to get back up to a 512 dimensional space. And for good luck, we add a couple of nonlinearities at the very, very top, a feed forward layer and a layer norm. Okay, but this is one, one sort of uh, iteration. So the end of this process is basically you take one sequence of embeddings and produce another sequence of embeddings, which are essentially contextually dependent. And of course, you can iterate this process. And in fact, the latest models might iterate this tens of times. Um, so they might be extremely deep and pr produce ex uh, in increasingly uh, deep representations under these kind of transformers. Okay. Um, so that leads us to BERT. This is the masking idea. So a second critical idea is that you can pre-train the parameters of these transformer models using very large amounts of unlabeled data. And I think this has been covered already, so I'll go over it very briefly. Basically, the idea is you mask out some random subset of words in the input sentence, and you try to train the parameters using backprop to predict each of those masked out words. And that means you can just take unlabeled data, convert it into a supervised problem, and pre-train all of the parameters of these transformers, namely these projection matrices A and B, and um, this projection matrix C. Okay, so you can, you can train them uh, on very large amounts of unlabeled data. And that, um, leads to a state-of-the-art model for question answering. So let me explain a little bit about how this is done. This is a baseline model we developed at Google at the time we released the data. Uh, we, es we essentially just leverage this very directly. So the input sequence to the model, x1 through xn, is simply a concatenation of the question together with a paragraph which may or may not contain an answer to the question. Uh, we apply transformers with BERT pre-training to obtain a new 512-dimensional uh, embedding for each input word, x1 through xn. And then we essentially just use these embeddings to predict the start and end point of an answer, or just null if no answer exists in the paragraph. So essentially, we're, we're applying this whole transformer machinery to get a representation of every word. And then we just use the 300,000 question answering examples to train in a supervised way the decision um, which looking at a question and looking at an entire paragraph to decide which is the most likely word to start the answer and which is the most likely word to end the answer. So an extremely simple architecture on top of these BERT-based models. So how well do these, these, these um, methods perform? Here's a leaderboard for, the, I think this is the current state of the leaderboard uh, for this task. Um, the best result so far is around 75% accuracy on question answering. Human performance is around 87%, so still a very large gap. And the model I just described, the simplest kind of BERT transformer-based model is around 66. So there's already been progress, but there's, there's quite a long way go, to go to, to human uh, levels of accuracy. Okay, let me finish up, though, talking about what I think are some really interesting current challenges in this kind of area. Um, there are obviously many questions regarding theory behind transformers. I'm not sure if we'll need a specialized theory or if um, there'll be uh, theory developed for, for general neural networks will apply to transformers, we'll see. Um, and that's very interesting. But the current thing I'm very interested in is to try to think about how humans perform question answering. Um, 
And in particular, to answer the question, can we build QA systems that reason explicitly when answering a question and actually explain their reasoning? So in some sense, having a system which just takes a question, spits out an answer without any justification for that answer is, I think, quite, quite limited and is really a rather impoverished, very useful, but nevertheless impoverished way of using language. Having systems that can actually explain their reasoning and give much more nuanced answers, particularly when there are multiple possible answers to a question under different interpretations and so on, uh, would really be a major, major step forward. So let me show some examples and talk about the kind of inferences that humans seem to be making and which I think we currently have very little idea of how to implement within neural architectures. Okay, um, these are not cherry-picked examples, really. It's, it's very, very easy to find examples of this form, okay? These were taken from, I think, the first 20 I looked through. Um, so here's the first question. Where did the captain sleep on the Mayflower, okay? Um, the passage containing the answer, this is a page on, uh, the Wikipedia page on the Mayflower. The critical sentence is this, aft on the main deck in the stern was the cabin for Master Christopher Jones, okay? And a human has highlighted this. Uh, and probably found it pretty easy to highlight this answer to the question. There's a lot going on here. Well, firstly, when we interpret the question, these kind of references, the captain, are intriguing. Anybody who would read this would guess with pretty high confidence you're referring to the captain of the Mayflower, right? We, we, we resolve these kind of references to objects in the world seamlessly, okay, uh, and unconsciously, arguably. Um, if we go through justifying this, well, uh, there's some common sense. People generally sleep in, cab uh, sleep in their cabin on a ship. Uh, you would have a suspicion where you see Master Christopher Jones that he's the captain of the Mayflower, but you'd go elsewhere on the page to actually figure that out. And, you, and ideally, a system should say, Master Christopher Jones was the captain, and here's the text that justifies this. Um, this sentence is omitting, and this is very frequent in Wikipedia and other domains, and again, is, is interpreted so seamlessly. Humans don't usually notice it. This is talking about the stern of the Mayflower. It's talking about the cabin of the Mayflower. It's talking about the main deck of the uh, Mayflower. They're all of these bridging references where, again, referential expressions like the main deck, the cabin, the stern are highly contextually dependent and are very often picking up, you know, a bridging to some salient entity in the discourse. I have no idea how to do this in a neural model right now. Um, here's another example. When did the Jets last win the Super Bowl? Okay, so. It would be easy enough to find this uh, answer in a knowledge, knowledge graph, but let's actually look at the, the text on a web page. Uh, and this is quite a complex example. It says, the Jets advanced the playoffs the first time in 1968 and went to compete in Super Bowl III where they defeated the Baltimore Colts. And then it goes on to say the history going on. It says, however, the Jets have never returned to the Super Bowl. So this is actually a multi-sentence inference. And it's clear from this narrative that the last time the Jets won the Super Bowl, was in Super Bowl III. Uh, and for people who really know their football, I guess they would have a suspicion that the Super Bowl, if the playoffs were in 68, the Super Bowl was actually played in 69. So 68 is actually a dubious answer here. Um, but again, there's, there's, a, there's a complex relationship between these, these two sentences and complex inference going on. Let me go over, maybe this is, uh, let me see how we're doing for time. Yeah, I should probably wrap up. Um, this is the last example I'll look at. So what might you find on a Mayan monument? This is a generic. These are very common and very interesting class of questions where it's talking about this indefinite phrase, a Mayan monument, is referring to sort of class of objects in the world. And this, is, this question is basically asking about a general property of those objects in the world. And, um, Here's a passage containing the answer, or actually containing several answers. So it says, Stellae were essentially stone banner banners raised to glorify the king and record his deeds, although the earliest examples depict mythological scenes. A lot going on here. Uh, Stellae and mine, mine monuments are equivalent. There's evidence elsewhere on the page. So again, you have um, some referential inference to go there. The earliest examples is bridging. It's actually referring to the earliest examples of Stellae. Again, we have these definite NPs which are highly contextually dependent. Uh, and finally, you know, if you have a pattern X to pick to Y, that implies you might find Y on X. So there's some kind of relational pattern going on here. And it's worth noting the remainder of the paragraph discuss, it discusses other imagery and you'd really want to pull out all of these answers, okay? Um, 
Last one I'll talk about. Who was the first person to see Earth from space? Since Gagarin was a Soviet pilot and cosmonaut, he became the first human to journey into outer space. This actually illustrates, um, you know, again, why I think explanations or rationales would be very useful in these kind of tasks. Um, this is a reasonable answer, but there are various assumptions. I mean, was there a window in the spacecraft? Could he really see the Earth? Is outer space the same thing as space? That's debatable. So these, these, refer you know, these phrases, these references are often uh, arguable as to whether they're equivalent or not. But a reasonable human would say, well, under the uh, assumption that by outer space you mean the same thing as space, this is an answer. And moreover, this is the conventional definition for outer space, and this is the conventional definition for space. You know, this, is, this is what I think really non-trivial language usage would look like in this kind of domain. OK, so um, I think I'm out of time. Um, so I'll finish up just to conclude. Yeah, so we're talking about these three problems, speech recognition, parsing, question answering, these three architectures. Um, there are many sort of theory-driven questions about how networks are learning effectively and generalizing effectively in these domains. But also, I think um, there are critical questions of how we can build neural models that explicitly reason, prevent, provide evidence for um, their answers, for example, in a question answering domain. Um, use common sense, semantics, and pragmatics in a much more, much less opaque way that humans can understand. Okay, I'll finish there. Thanks a lot.